Who in their right mind would put a fighter plane on a ramp and use a rocket booster to lift it straight into the air? The plane was flying at approximately 175 miles per hour. When the booster ran out of fuel and came to rest, the plane crashed into the earth in less than 20 seconds. This launch was deemed a success by the US Air Force because there was no pilot in the aircraft. The rough landing was anticipated. A rocket-assisted takeoff uses tiny rocket pods to assist the aircraft's acceleration when the runway is too short or the aircraft is overloaded. To do this, a small rocket or rockets are mounted on the sides of the fuselage and are ignited by the pilot when additional thrust is required. Now, assisting an aeroplane with a short takeoff off a short runway is one thing. When you wish to take off from a zero-length runway or from a stationary posture straight into the air, it's a whole different situation. The reason why the Americans, Germans, and Soviets all started experimenting with zero-length aircraft launches in the 1950s, and why these programs were ultimately abandoned in spite of their success, is not what you may think. During the Cold War, the Soviet Union's ability to send atomic weapons over international borders was one of the worst scenarios for the US and its allies. With the fighter fleet grounded and unable to mount a counterattack an airbase in the US or Europe, could now be entirely destroyed in one strike. Fighter planes may be placed on a ramp on the back of a truck and then launched directly into the air with the aid of a rocket booster, much like launching a missile, as one solution to this issue. Imagine being the first person to fly a fighter plane that has been installed on a platform, strapped to a rocket booster, tilted up at a 20-degree angle, and is about to take off. The reason the pilot is entering the cockpit a little slower is because there are many things that could go wrong. There is no hesitancy. It's caused by the size of his enormous balls. On January 5, 1954, the US Air Force used a rocket to launch an F-84G Thunderjet with a human pilot inside, while the aeroplane engines were running at full power prior to takeoff. This was the first ever Manziel launch. The test pilot, Bob Turner, claimed that the G-forces experienced during takeoff were comparable to those experienced when a plane is thrown from an aircraft carrier. However, the US Air Force had fired a cruise missile in a similar fashion in 1949, five years earlier. In actuality, Zell was a manned aircraft adaption of guided missile launching methods. This resembles Zell in practically every way. The key distinction is that this aircraft is not like other aeroplanes. The first operational surface-to-surface -surface cruise missile developed and produced by the US is the MGM. M1 Matador. It resembled an aeroplane in terms of its control surfaces. In reality, it was awarded the name B-61 by the US Air Force, precisely like a bomber aircraft. Many of the lessons learned from the MGM-1 and the succeeding rocket-assisted missiles were then applied to and modified for the Zell program. For instance, the F-84's first testing utilized the exact same solid fuel rocket booster from the MGM-1. The rocket booster was discarded once its fuel ran out in order to remove the excess weight and lessen drag. One of the major advantages of the Zell program was that it allowed current aircraft to be launched without a runway, rather than needing to construct entirely new aircraft that could do so. Though not for the same reasons as the US, the Soviets also tested the Zell on MiG-19s. Zell was primarily of interest to the Soviets for point defense against important targets. As a result, even in the absence of an airfield, a high-value target might be secured by a MiG-19 on standby. Together with Lockheed, the German Air Force, or Luftwaffe, began conducting Zell tests with the F-104 Starfighter in 1963. At Edwards Air Force Base in the United States, the testing's preliminary stages took place. Instead of employing actual aircraft for this portion of the testing, Lockheed created mock-ups out of steel and concrete. But why did they act in that way? The rocket booster was a crucial part of the zero-length launch systems. The rocket booster had to be powerful enough to accelerate the plane by 2 to 4 miles per hour, but it also had to be positioned correctly in relation to the plane. The booster is not completely in the back, and it is not in line with the fuselage for a reason. The rocket's thrust must be precisely directed towards the aircraft's center of gravity, otherwise a pitch, roll, or yaw movement would result. Due to low dynamic pressure, the pilot has little aerodynamic control until the aircraft has reached a sufficient speed. He is thus totally dependent on the rocket alignment. The initial testing could be accomplished at substantially lesser costs and without destroying actual aircraft because these mock-ups had the same weight and center of gravity as the F-104. The program relocated to the Lechfeld Air Base in Germany after the initial tests were successful, where a fixed launch platform was constructed for the ensuing flights. Zell may have made it possible to launch counterattacks, but that only addressed a portion of the issue. Those planes still needed to land somewhere else. This is why a different program was being created concurrently, which was a horrible idea in hindsight. A program called Zero Length Launch Mat Landing, or Zelmol, looked into the viability of a zero length landing. An arresting cable, a tailhook, and an inflatable rubber mat were to be used to achieve this for the landing in the absence of an airstrip. We assume it resembled this in a
appearance. There were only two man landings, both of which resulted in back or neck injuries for the pilots. Eventually, for a variety of related reasons, the ZELP program was discontinued by the Americans, the Soviets, and the Germans. Without a safe landing option, the pilot would have had to force himself out of the plane, which would have destroyed it. Parts of the German Autobahn proved to be a workable choice for aircraft launching and landing, even big freight planes, as was later tested in 1980. Nevertheless, despite all, the development of intercontinental ballistic missiles significantly decreased the need for aircraft for nuclear strike missions. Furthermore, the development of some toll and stole aircraft, such the British Harrier and the Soviet Yak-38, was driven by the eventual goal of having aircraft that could operate independently from a landing strip. In fact, the Harrier made its first vertical takeoff in 1967, just one year after the Germans ended their ZELT program.